This is Sonia Pryor Jones speaking from the Fab Foundation. And so, on behalf of the Fab Foundation and Scope, I'd like to welcome you all to our second webinar. Um, as a part of the Scopes project, we have developed a webinar series um, where not only will we have an opportunity to highlight projects and people on the website, but we also want to create some other engaging opportunities to get people together to talk about all of the kinds of projects that we think um, digital fabrication uniquely can bring to schools and learning environments all around the world. Um, and so today we're really excited um, to have IU1, Intermediate Unit, Unit 1, talking with us about the role that digital fabrication is playing in their work as it relates to mental wellness. Um, for those of you um, who know it, this month, the month of May, is dedicated to mental wellness and health um, in that regard and really thinking about the whole student. Um, and how schools and other um, institutional institutions can really support um, whole development with um, students and learners, but specifically in the work that IU1 has been doing, they've really been focusing in on um, the mental wellness of the students that they serve. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a brief introduction of them shortly, where they're going to really get into some of the nuts and bolts of what they've been doing. Um, once they've had an opportunity to present some of their key ideas and their key work, we'll open it up to everyone for Q&A. Um, we will mute everyone, um, and then we'll give you an opportunity to raise your hand with the features of Zoom. And so um, there are features in the, in the application that allow you to raise your hand so that we can have some level of order around the questioning. We'll do the best that we can. There is also a chat box. And so if you don't want to raise your hand and pose the question yourself, you can write it in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to it. We do want to make sure that everyone knows that all of our webinars are recorded. And so we have developed a YouTube channel where webinars will be stored. And anyone who's registered and on the webinar today will send you a follow-up email that has the link to the YouTube channel um, where you can uh, go back and listen. And we'll also send you a survey in order for us to really do this work well, we need to hear from you and are always looking for ways to improve um, what we're delivering um, with you and to you through our network. So without further ado, I want to take a couple of minutes to um, further introduce the IU1 team who's going to talk with you about the role of digital fabrication and mental wellness. Um, and so we've got um, the Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Ms. Jenny Lent. Um, from IU1. Um, she has been focusing on um, curriculum and technology as well as literacy. Um, before uh, her current position, she worked as a school librarian and middle school English teacher and has certifications in secondary education, English as a second language, as well as library science and information technology. Um, Jenny has been a key champion along with um, Mr. Don Martin at IU1 in bringing the Fab Lab to their community. So we're really excited to have Jenny with us. Also with us from IU1 is Mr. Joe Mahoney. He's the Director of Behavior, Behavioral and Mental Health and Social Work at IU1. Um, he's a graduate of Duquesne University with a BA in Psychology and English and also has a master's of social work focused on mental health from the University of Pittsburgh. And um, he has um, been working with the entire team at IU1 to further integrate mental health um, and wellness practices, practices into the work that they're doing with Fab Labs. And then we have Michelle Boyholter. And Michelle, please correct me if I've ruined your last name. Um, Michelle is the Fab Lab social worker at IU1 and has been working on the ground with the uh, rest of the instructional team um, as an 18 year veteran in social work, really helping to serve students with social, emotional and mental health challenges. And prior to working um, in the school social work setting, she worked in community mental health as well as physical health locations. And you're gonna get a chance to see some of the work that Michelle has done the lessons in IU1 special collection, which is on the Scopes website. And so we're really excited to, to have that entire team with you. Um, so at this- That was close. 
<laughs> At this point in time, we're going to um, just show it for you right now our general working agenda. I've done the welcome and introductions. We're going to turn things over to IU1 for about 30 minutes or so to present their work um, and then open up for formal Q&A and then have some closing remarks at the end. So let's turn the screen back over to Joe um, so that he can get us started. Yes. So I think, I think they want to get me started, Sonia. Okay. I apologize for that. That's okay. No worries. And so um, Don Martin um, is the executive director at IU1, and he has also joined us and has a few remarks. Go ahead, Don. So I'm always a party crasher, so I've crashed this party today um, because uh, I really felt in talking with Joe and Jenny and, and Michelle and our staff at IU1, we really felt that we had a, a I get to tell this really cool story um, to kind of set things up. And so uh, I want to really set this up in, in terms of, of how this all started with mental health uh, and students with behavioral issues. Uh, when in 2015, when we started this initiative, and, and shortly before that, um, when, when the Fab Lab idea came to IU1, we were really, really interested in looking at digital fabrication and all of the bells and whistles that go with it, um, particularly with our alternative ed students. We operate uh, four campus schools that we call them, and we operate a variety of programs, uh, ranging from alternative education to uh, learning support to emotional support um, all the way up to, you know, autistic support. Um, we have therapeutic emotional support classrooms, and our newest program is called Comprehensive Therapeutic Emotional Support Classrooms. And we, uh, that's acronym is CTES. We have acronyms for everything at the IU. Um, and so let me just tell you that when we started this uh, with the gracious efforts of the Fab Foundation, as well as the Chevron Corporation that funded this program, uh, and, the, and the Benetton Foundation, a local funder in Pittsburgh. Um, we had our sights set on really focusing, uh, starting off small and starting with alternative ed. These are students that do not have uh, mental health issues. Um, these are students that do not, uh, may not have uh, an individualized education plan. These are students that simply um, are students that have been, for whatever reason, not invited back to their home school because of any kind of infraction. So that can range from pulling a fire alarm and a 45 day expulsion, all the way up to having a lot of different infractions and students that are coming to us that really couldn't, um, uh, really just couldn't uh, go uh, or, or coordinate or communicate or um, uh, focus in the mainstream. <clears throat> so um, when we started that, we, we started with our alternative ed programs and everything was going great. Um, and I happened to be doing a site visit one day, um, along with Joe Mahoney, who at the time was a supervisor of mental health services, and I was going up to see how the Fab Lab was doing at our colonial site. And as I was walking up through the hallway, um, we have our CTES kids. Now keep in mind, these are students that are one step away from a hospitalization program. These are students that have some really, really severe uh, mental health issues, behavioral issues, um, and they require a lot of social work, a lot of uh, added supports, a lot of resources. And it's not odd to see these students that are having difficulty during their day. <clears throat> and as I was walking this particular day up to our fab lab, I walked down the hallway and I happened to see a student who was on the floor, who was really, really uh, being unruly. Um, there were two paraprofessionals, there was a teacher, there was a social worker, and I believe a psychologist. Um, and this is one of those moments where, um, Typically, you could keep walking um, and kind of mind your own business and let them, them handle business. Um, and for whatever reason that day, I stopped. I don't know why I stopped, but I did. And um, I tried to render aid with those folks and um, got the student up and the student was really, really upset. And I asked the student his name um, and he told me his name was Robert. Um, I asked him how old he was and he said he was eight years old. And I asked him why he was having such a difficult day. And uh, because this webinar is recorded, um, I won't tell you what he said, uh, because he had a few choice words for me um, that really uh, wouldn't really like to repeat. Uh, Joe was with me, so Joe heard some of those words as well. 
Um, at that point in time, I really tried to just reach into my back pocket and see what we can do to get Robert out of the hallway and out of that mainstream as it was beginning to create somewhat of a scene. And so I asked Robert if he'd like to see something really cool and come with me. Um, and at first he was reluctant, but then he was curious. And I said, this is a really cool thing. I think you're going to really like it. And uh, I walked him down to the fab lab. And it just so happens that uh, one of our star teachers, Kevin McKee, was doing this really, really cool lesson um, with elementary students on a 3D printer. And I walked Robert in um, and I said to uh, Mr. McKee, could you please show my man Robert here how the 3D printer works, Mr. McKee, and, and some of the things that go along with it. Um, and I got to tell you, long story short, um, within 45 seconds, this student had absolutely de-escalated and he was asking meaningful questions. Uh, I began to ask meaningful questions and, and high level and really inquiry questions about the, the, the 3D printer. Um, this is a student with mental health issues that keep in mind 45 seconds ago or a minute and a half before that was having a meltdown in the hallway. Um, and he started to really ask some good questions and he wanted to know if he could participate and if he could make something on the 3D printer. Um, at that point, um, I kind of looked over at Mr. McKee and kind of looked at Joe Mahoney and thought maybe we should have really rethought this process because we were really guilty of stereotyping these students and I'll be the first one to admit it. These are students with mental health issues. These are students that we had thought we don't want them to be around sharp instruments. We didn't want them to be around things where they can hurt themselves or others. And we certainly didn't want them to be around uh, equipment that costs thousands of dollars. Um, these are students that typically will roll their desks over. They have knocked filing cabinets over. We have seen rooms that look like um, a tornado had gone through it, to be quite honest with you. But lo and behold, this eight-year-old young man was able to keep his attention, and he was asking those meaningful questions. And from that point on, um, we regrouped um, the next day. We called a meeting, and we said, look, we really need to rethink this, because if Robert who was one of our more challenging students, suddenly became interested in this and was asking questions, then perhaps we're onto something with our mental health students. Joe and Jenny began to immediately implement the curriculum. This was before Michelle's involvement. Um, and they began to do a lot of collaboration with the teachers. And I can tell you that um, I'm happy to say, and they're gonna tell you this story today, but I'm happy to say that um, that's a priority for our mental health students now. All of them are, uh, have equal time in the fab lab. Uh, we now provide therapy in the fab lab. It's really interesting because when you think about group therapy and you're trying to get young uh, eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds to talk, um, sometimes it's difficult in a cold room with the group. But isn't it interesting how, if you think about it, when we do projects, we, we're always talking with one another. And so that's where the social work aspect comes in. And that's where we're able to provide that therapy in the fab lab. Um, but I'm really, really excited that um, our students have done so well. Um, they're going to share some statistics with you today that really are kind of unbelievable, but believe me, they're true. Um, those students um, are really, really doing a great job in that environment. Uh, the problem that we've encountered this year that we're now tackling through uh, project-based learning is that these kids are great when they go in the fab lab. The problem is when we send them back to their room, sometimes they're even more unruly than when they left because you can't just turn a switch on and turn it off with these kids. And so now we're showing, uh, and we're really working with our teachers on project-based learning, and we're providing thematic units, which will start next year, where everything will be centered around the fab lab with those students. And, and the projects that they're working on. So they won't have to any longer open their math books to page 35 and have a fit. But I thought it was important to start this off by, <clears throat> excuse me, telling you, <clears throat> excuse me, by telling you this Robert story because it's a, it's a story that um, had I not attended that day and had I not run into Robert in the hallway and had I not decided to stop and had Robert not decided to cooperate, there's a lot of what ifs, but from that day, um, we base it on that wonderful story with that little uh, young eight-year-old who's doing very well in our programs today um, as a result of it, and not only Robert, but a lot of other students. So I hope that sets the scene uh, for what you're about to hear from people who uh, have worked much harder than me on this initiative 
But uh, it's been a true, and I've said this now for the last four years, this has been an absolute game changer on the way that we instruct our kids in IU1. Um, absolute game changer and absolutely different results with kids. Um, these are great kids who have some issues that I think, um, I don't think, but through the Fab Lab, we've been able to really take a look at how we educate those students and how they interact and communicate. And with that, I'll turn things over to Joe Mahoney and he can begin discussing from his perspective. Thanks, Mr. Martin. Great recollection of Robert, or boy Robert, uh, who, who is still there and doing well. Um, at this point, we have a, a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and, and Jenny Lent is gonna kick us off and, and set up a little bit more background just about who IU1 is what we do in general, um, a little bit more about our Fab Lab and our Fab Lab curriculum, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper into that mental health component. So, can everybody good? Can everybody see the screen? Yes, looks good, Joe. Perfect. So, take it away, Jenny. Thanks, Joe. So, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Martin, for that wonderful story about Robert and how he made a tremendous impact on the direction that our lab um, has taken from the very start. Um, and thank you, Sonia, for introducing uh, all of us who you can see on this uh, first screen. Uh, tell you a little bit about Intermediate Unit 1. Intermediate Unit 1 is an educational service agency, and we service a three-county area, Fayette, Green, and Washington counties, which is in southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, we have 25 school districts and five CTCs that we service, so those districts and CTCs can send their students to um, our, our four schools or our locations when the students aren't achieving success in the regular classroom, whether that's because they're alternative ed or special education or emotional support, we're able to provide some more intensive help to those students. We have four campus schools, which you'll see on the screen, Clark, Colonial, Waynesburg, and Laboratory. I'm excited to say that our original lab started in our Colonial campus. We have since added a lab in our Waynesburg campus, and we'll be adding a third laboratory, or third lab in our laboratory school uh, this fall. So we really are expanding our uh, stationary labs to have three by the fall so that we can impact more students. Our uh, Fab Lab was uh, funded by Chevron. We uh, have the same equipment as the other Fab Labs that are out there. We've added a few additional pieces here and there, but it's pretty standard um, and similar to what everyone else has installed in their uh, Fab Labs as well. We do have a video. I'm not sure if the video will play through the feed or not. Um, Let's if hope. It, if it doesn't, we can, um, we can move on and share that out uh, via a link. Nope, I don't, think the I don't think the audio is working. So we'll share with you a short video. Um, we can put that in the chat box, send that link in the chat box and uh, you can take a look at the short video that we have that was created for us um, by the Pennsylvania Department of Education as we're an innovation uh, center in Pennsylvania as well. So we'll sh uh, share that link out with you so that you have that link as well. So our Fab Lab, as you can see a few pictures of our Colonial Lab and our Mobile Lab, uh, we do operate a curriculum, as Mr. Martin said. It's based on grade spans, so our curriculum is K-2, to 3-5, to 6-8, to and 9-12. to 12. And in those grade spans, we have uh, projects that are by nine weeks. So we have grouped uh, pieces of equipment together and projects together that make sense for those grade spans. In addition to that, we're gonna start adding additional uh, coursework this year around entrepreneurship uh, and how that ties to the Fab Lab as well as some additional electives. So we are continuing to grow our program and this summer we'll be writing additional curriculum to add to uh, what we already offer. Our curriculum does revolve around the tenets of making for self, making for your immediate surroundings and then making for the world at large. And we really focus on, on those tenants as the core to what we do when we're in the lab with our students. So as we said at the kind of 
top of all this, um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, so we, we really at IU1 um, are trying to focus some special activities around Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and we wanted to share, you know, just some statistics to kind of show why it's important that we have a special month dedicated just to mental health awareness. Um, so, uh, you know, as the name suggests, May is dedicated to raising awareness for mental health um, and also eliminating the stigma for mental health diagnoses. Uh, you know, they estimate 10 to 20% of children worldwide experience mental health disorders. Uh, children are defined as uh, age 17 and younger, birth to 17. Um, and if untreated, the, these conditions can adversely affect education, social functioning, uh, school performance, job performance, uh, you know, whatever it may be. So mental health is kind of pervasive and really does impact every, uh, you know, sector of, of a person's life. Half of all mental illness began by age 14. Um, a lot of the mental illness that we see today um, in adults and our kids um, can start very, very young. We see signs of that very, very young. Um, the ones that can't be diagnosed before age 14 are usually an insurance reason why they can't be diagnosed before age 14, but they're still there. Um, so that's kind of a staggering thing to think about. Think about what a lot of our kids are kind of battling. 264 million people worldwide struggle with depression and 284 million people worldwide struggle with some form of anxiety disorder. Um, you know, that's a lot of people in the world. So, so it's good that, that there is this kind of month dedicated to just bringing awareness towards these issues. And, and as we know, this makes sense when you think about it. Childhood conditions form a critical component of health and well-being later in life. Mental health is related to mental and psychological well-being. And that's really what we're gonna delve into today is, is how We've kind of used the fab lab and that space in the fab lab and, and the kind of unique experiences in that fab lab to really improve mental and psychological well-being. We're really focused on mental wellness. Um, and, and we were very, very careful to, to word it as such because that's what we really want to focus on. And, and also, I think at any point in time, any of us kind of, regardless of what's going on in our lives or if we have a mental health diagnosis or not, we all have those bad days where we kind of need to dedicate to just getting our, our mental wellness in line and, and helping ourselves. So I think Mr. Martin did a really nice job at the beginning and laying out what comprehensive therapeutic emotional support at IU1 is. Um, we started this program seven years ago, I believe, um, at IU1. We started with four classrooms um, amongst the three counties. We are now up to 12 classrooms. Most of them are operating at max capacity. Um, max capacity is 12 students um, per classroom. So we're, you know, we're running pretty full. Um, unfortunately, there is a, a great need for this kind of programming. Uh, CTS, as Mr. Martin said, is geared for students who have more in-depth mental health issues. Um, similar in concept to what we call partial hospitalization program. A partial program is kind of a, a, a step down from an inpatient or a long-term residential stay or a step up before a student maybe reaches a point of, a, of an inpatient or a long-term residential stay. So it's kind of that middle ground. Uh, we provide therapeutic support with a master's level licensed social worker per classroom around the clock. So those social workers are there not only for their own kind of scheduled group times uh, where they're kind of on as, as we like to think of it, but they're also there during the academic times to really kind of catch a, a behavior before it escalates um, catch an antecedent to a behavior before it escalates um, and, and really kind of work with those students on those de-escalation strategies and coping strategies um, that, that they need to have to kind of be successful, you know, in their school day and, and outside their school day. Uh, we also do provide doctor time throughout the month. We have a psychiatrist who comes on site to each of our sites two times a month per site. Um, our psychiatrist provides medication management services, evaluation services, um, for, for these students. Um, and this reduces a lot of the barriers for mental health um, that we see, transportation barriers, scheduling barriers, whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, hopefully getting these students set up at a faster rate with mental health services. These are just some of the mental health diagnoses that, that we encounter um, in our CTS program. And these are the students that have these mental health diagnoses are also working within our fab labs. Um, so we have mood disorders, bipolar disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, generalized anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Each of these disorders kind of have a very unique 
you know, criteria to, to diagnose, very specific treatment interventions. There are whole classes pretty much that, that somebody could take in, in each of these disorders and diagnoses. Um, so I'm not going to really delve into all of that. Um, but if anybody wants more information on any of these, you know, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, but I do just want to highlight just to, to kind of, you know, kind of give the perspective of what our students are struggling with when, when they're working with us in our center-based programs and how severe some of their needs are. Um, so I'd like to go into just a, a little bit, just a very brief kind of description of maybe what a mood disorder might look like. Because mood disorder is pretty common. Uh, that, that is probably the second most common diagnosis we encounter with our students. So mood disorder, you know, think about it as your depression. Um, your, your depression's on a spectrum, on a continuum of diagnoses. Um, and most of our students kind of are on that more severe end of that spectrum with depression. Um, so, so these are students that have disturbances in, in sleep patterns. Um, maybe they're sleeping too much. They might be sleeping 14 hours a day, um, or they might be not getting any sleep, maybe three to four hours a night they might be getting. Um, what's important is just a deviation from their baseline. That's kind of determines if the sleep disturbance is a, a, a issue of concern and an issue of diagnosis. Um, in addition to sleep disturbances, we have uh, appetite disturbances. Um, you know, similar, it's a deviation from baseline, eating too much, eating too little, energy disturbances, um, low mood. Um, the interesting thing with depression, though, is especially in, in teenagers and youth, um, depression manifests a lot as anger, um, anger outbursts, irritability. Um, so, so we see a lot more kind of physical um, and outward components to the depression with the group that we work with. Um, it doesn't always look as that kind of withdrawn, sad kid. These kids are angry. They might be explosive. Um, they might be going off a little bit at their teacher or peer. Um, and especially in boys, we, we have a lot of boys that we work with and, and, and boys um, young boys and through youth, um, their key criteria for diagnosis is anger um, and, and irritability. And I do share that just to kind of show that we were taking a risk with these students, um, putting them in the fab lab, as Mr. Martin said. We were concerned about them just kind of displaying these outward behaviors. Um, we, we were concerned about if, if they would hurt themselves or someone else when they were having an outburst um, around the equipment. So, you know, I just kind of share that to highlight how severe some of our students are that we work with. We also, in addition to the mental health diagnoses of our students, um, we, we do have pretty severe contextual factors that come into play with our students that intersect with their mental health and, and mental wellness. Um, we are in our counties, we are, all three counties actually are considered um, low SES, a low socioeconomic, um, high free and, reduced, free and reduced lunch populations, a lot of poverty. Um, so these kids are, are, are living in impoverished conditions, don't have access a lot of times to abundance of food, hot water, running water at all. Um, so, you know, that's a, a big factor for a lot of our students. They also have intellectual and academic challenges. Um, you know, how can a kid attend to a math test when they might be dealing with a depression diagnosis in addition to not having running water at home? Maybe they haven't eaten in 24, 48 hours. Um, so that's kind of what we're up against as well. Um, family dynamics become an issue. Uh, a lot of broken homes. A lot of our kids are being raised by extended family, grandparents, great grandparents, aunts, uncles. A lot of our kids are in the foster systems. Uh, going along those lines, addiction. Um, a lot of our kids, if they don't struggle with addiction themselves, drug and alcohol addiction, then chances are likely that a family member does, um, that, th that their parent or their caregiver has a strong addiction in the family. Exposure to gang and domestic violence. Um, a lot of our kids are, have witnessed um, their, their parents fighting at home using physical violence. We have a lot of our kids that have lost loved ones, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, grandparents, fathers, mothers to gang violence. Um, and then they come into the school the next day when their cousin was, was just shot dead outside their doorstep the night before in a gang, in a gang um, related incident. Uh, all this obviously causes trauma. Um, in our kids, so we're going up against that factor. Um, abuse, um, our kids are physically abused a lot of the times, sexually abused, neglected, don't have access to a lot of their basic needs. Um, since we are so rural, they have little to no access to mental health services in the counties. Um, what they do have might be at one end of the county and they don't have transportation to get there. 
Um, the wait lists are long. Sometimes it's 60 to 90 days for these kids to get into an outside doctor um, to be seen. So that's kind of why we created this program to, to reduce some of those barriers as best as we could to get them access in their most natural environment, which would be obviously their school. So I do share that just to kind of show again what we're up against and why these results are so important um, because it is transformative what we've seen in the fab lab and those, in those making environments with our students. I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Voidhoff for now and she's gonna share a little bit more about what she does in the day-to-day -day in her fab lab work as that social worker that is specifically dedicated to this population, specifically in the fab environment. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, that gives a good background of what our, our classroom mil milieu is like, uh, a mixture of different um, mental health diagnoses as well as different challenges. Uh, and as Dr. Martin uh, re referred to is that, um, yes, these kids turn around. <laughs> they really um, are interested. It is the uh, fabricating, the engagement. Um, like he said, busy hands, they are, in, they are interested. Um, as a social worker in, in this um, environment, uh, this is new. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, kids are, are making, they are creating. Um, and they are using things, uh, as Jenny said, for self and um, that they can use themselves. They are talking, using things for their um, surroundings and for the greater world. And those are some of the lessons that we developed um, that were therapeutic in the classroom. We, we began with some mindfulness training um, so that kids can become more aware of themselves, their thoughts, their feelings. Um, and each of the lessons um, that are posted there under our collection um, talks about different links and um, videos and research that you're able to reference so that you're able to do that in your maker's lab. Um, and we keep it simple so that it doesn't require um, the master's level training um, like we bring to the classroom, but um, just noticing that you're able to uh, control your breath is empowering for students. Um, and that you can name your thoughts um, is a, a game changer because you can communicate that. I am thinking, I am feeling, and then you can modulate what the, what the response experience is like um, and move through the project so that you're experiencing um, uh, success um, to overcome the challenges of whatever your mental health status brings to the table. So even if you are in a depressed state, even if you are experiencing extreme anxiety, uh, if new um, experiences give you anxiety, like you have some tribulation about that, then um, I am there in the fab lab as well as other social workers that are from the classroom with that student um, to um, help that student um, uh, regulate what that experience is like for him or her so that um, the mental health is addressed as well as the learning is able to occur um, because the emotional and the mental health status um, needs have been addressed. Michelle, I'm going to ask you, uh, before we jump in the website, I have a question to ask you. That, okay. That I think would be really good to kind of illustrate this. Um, okay. You have worked at your time at the IU, you've worked in those more traditional settings, um, you know, providing that, that kind of direct individual or group support kind of in that more traditional setting. And now you're doing this kind of non-traditional thing um, mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the fab lab and the maker space. And we kind of have you thinking outside the box a little bit here. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but let me ask you, what, do you, what have you seen in those differences between your experience in those more traditional settings versus this? What are you seeing about how the students are willing to kind of engage in that process while their hands are occupied and they're engaged in a, in a really good maybe task that they're kind of interested in or their hands are busy? Mm -hmm. I think the focus, uh, the focus of the, the Maker's Lab is, um, is the primary um, motivation. So while you're addressing the mental health needs and you're able to provide that intervention, um, you're, you're facilitating that uh, intervention in a different way because you're not processing that emotion, you're 
um, facilitating um, moving through the barrier that maybe the mental health um, challenge presents so that then the learning is occurring. So um, there's a different outcome um, because the, um, of the makerspace. So they're creating, they know that they're going to uh, be able to take something with them that they've created, that they own, um, that they can give to someone else. Um, so it, it, the setting does make all the difference. Um, you know, both as a, as a motivation um, and as an outcome. Okay. Thanks, Michelle, for that. Sorry, the computer's Okay, sure. I'm Any other questions? All right. I'm going to pull up the lesson. Um, okay. If you and Jenny kind of want to walk through that a little bit here. And uh, I already have it pulled up, but here's the link for anybody that is interested. So Joe, I'll, I'll kind of start off with the lesson. So the lesson plans that you'll see inside of the collections, um, we have three lesson plans posted. One is an MP3 speaker that's been remixed. So uh, we originally posted the MP, MP3 uh, speaker, our fab manager a few years ago posted that. We have remixed that speaker uh, to add mental health components so that you can see how the mental health actually works along with the content. So Michelle has done a great job since the MP3 three speakers around sound, incorporating sound into that. We have a rally towel lesson that we have mental health aspects to, as well as a flashlight lesson. So you'll see in, in all three lessons how Michelle's done a fantastic job starting the lesson with mindfulness and mental health and incorporating it throughout the entire lesson. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle to talk about how she's uh, incorporating those mental health strategies into the lesson. Okay, here in the, um, I, don't, I don't believe I can link onto anything here, um, but here we begin with a, a go noodle exercise. Um, the link is there and it's called From Mindless to Mindful. Um, um, yeah, right here with the breathe. And so we're, we're focusing on our attention. Um, well, yeah, so, sorry, Joe, you won't be able to do it because I have it on my screen. <laughs> so anyway, so let me just tell you about it. So with the, with the breath work, uh, we are working with um, just noticing so we're taking our focus inward and we're taking our locus of control to ourselves. So we can control our breath. We can um, just notice that our breath is in our nose, in our chest, in our bellies. It, we can feel it in our backs. We can feel our hands relax. Our feet are flat on the floor. Our focus is inward. Our minds are clear. Our bodies are still, and now we're ready to work. And in this lesson, there also is a bell ringing. So because we're talking about the MP3 speaker and sound, I take the lesson all through the physics of sound that Mr. McKee has written um, also, and uh, present that, uh, listen to the sound of the bell ringing until you can no longer hear it. So with the MP3 speaker, we're focusing not only on the physics, but also on the t attention uh, of your mind, the, the, the um, hearing, listening to the bell, seeing, okay, because you're looking at your focus, the, the video has some dots. So you can notice distractions, but your focus is on the one still dot. So you're able to focus on your project even though other students are moving about the room, they're at different places in their project, but you're able to focus just on you and your project. Um, so that is really an important mindful practice as far as increasing focus and calming that emotional reaction um, that Mr. Martin was talking about in the hallway. So we don't have that. Um, because our bodies are still and our minds are clear. Um, and then there's another little video link in there um, that talks about um, what is 
um, awareness. And this is really uh, important because it transfers the skill to the classroom. So as you're learning about self-awareness and you're focusing a, a attention, um, you're able to take that um, back to the classroom. So even though you may be doing a different project um, and you're not hands-on, you still um, have control over what it is um, that you have your breath, you have your, your attention in your body, and now you are more self-aware. So that, that's, there's some really good research in that lesson as far as um, taking a look at um, how that applies um, to mental health as well as just um, uh, more generalized instructional strategies um, so that students are successful in any environment. So any other questions about that? Um, our goal with that one was just practicing mindfulness so that we are um, calm and um, ready to learn. And, and, and Michelle, um if you want to talk a little bit about how you were able through this exercise, through this activity, um, and kind of the, those mindfulness exercises that you were working on to tie in the actual process of sound with the MP3 speaker, how you were able to tie that into kind of mindful relaxation they can take with them outside the fab lab. Okay, well, that was primarily through the sounding bell uh, in the instrument and um, also just the physics of sound, um, how those are wavelengths and um, how your thoughts and feelings produce different wavelengths. Um, so we were just using metaphors back and forth between components of the physics of sound and um, how that works um, with the breathing. We use the Hoberman sphere for like showing that your breath goes in and out. Um, we use um, uh, different mindfulness practices that are online from Heart, Heart Mind Kids and um, different uh, resources so that really anyone can pick up um, that lesson plan and be able to link to those resources, play them out, and um, just pretty much have the same effect. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, we were trying to generalize. Any questions about that? <laughs> so that was like a really good starting point. Um, with with the mindful practice, because we begin it with the breath. Absolutely. Something that you could use anywhere. And that's what we're really trying to teach here is just a life skill. Yep, we, we want to teach them the, the skills that they can transfer to any environment um, to, to kind of help with that and, and trying to tie that back into those kind of making fabrication pieces that take place in that fab lab. So there's a seamless overlap. So Michelle, this is Jenny. Can you talk a little bit more about just briefly, don't go into detail about the other two lessons and the connection you used for mental health. So when we made the speaker, we know we connected that to sound therapies. Okay. And things that help students that way, because we want to make sure that what we're doing is relevant to the content of the actual fabrication lesson. So can you talk exactly. a about the rally towel and what was behind the techniques behind that? And then the uh, mini LED flashlight techniques. Well. Okay. With the, um, Mini, mini flashlight, uh, we use the, the uh, light metaphor. Um, in the lesson, uh, Mr. McKee has um, a lot of material about, um, again, the light and the dark, and then the uh, resistors as a force, uh, and then the battery as a power source. So um, in, in that lesson, we used um, the metaphor for light and even in the uh, YouTube that Mr. McKee has in there, it describes um, light 
as um, lifting the darkness, like at, during a time of psychological stress. Um, so we um, also used um, a thoughts and feelings. So by naming your thoughts and feelings, uh, we used a little video there about Inside Out movie to name happy, sad, angry, disgusted, scared. Um, so um, they're naming what they're feeling. And then we did the body scan exercise so they know what it feels like. And then we use I statements. So we're improving communication by naming what it is that we're thinking and feeling. Um, and with the, with the flashlight during the whole process, like the uh, container, the um, pressure fit container, um, that is like your body. So, you know, you can modulate like the resistor, what it is that you're thinking and feeling. And um, we just use these skills um, like motivational interviewing throughout the lesson so that students are able to apply what we're learning throughout their making process um, because then they have a different outcome. You know, they're, they're not uh, becoming frustrated like where we, where we use the I statement, I am feeling angry, I am feeling frustrated. I can tell that in my body because my, my jaw is clenched, my, my fists are tight, uh, I, feel my, I feel heat. Um, so I know that I need to relax my body. Um, I can take a mindful moment. I can say that I am angry. I can tell you that I need to do something different. I can ask for help. So instead of just quitting the project and saying, this is too hard, this is too complicated, um, I'm too dumb, I can't do this, um, we learn skills for um, reframing that so it can be communicated and, and the student can complete the project with success and then they're very proud of it. Thank you, Michelle, for that um, quick explanation. Okay. I know we have yeah. to be cognizant of everyone's time tonight as well. Right, right. Because there's, there's lots of really great links in there um, so that you can just pretty much click and play and uh, be able to get um, all those connections. And Thank then, you. Thank yeah. you very much for sharing those. And, and I do mm -hmm. encourage everyone to go to our special collection on the SCOPE site. On the drop down, it just says IU1 Mental Health Collection. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see all three lessons and links to everything Michelle's talking about have been in mm -hmm. those lessons. So yeah. we, we have learned quite a few les lessons from what we've done so far, but we are continuing to grow and learn. We have a mental health study that we'll be performing in the fall with our students in the lab to gather some, some more data about the impact of what we're doing. We're excited about that, but um, you know, as we continue to plug away and, and learn lessons, we'd love to share with all of you as well. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions you may have at this time. Jenny, I think as people are preparing their questions, would you mind sharing a little bit more about the larger study that you all are engaged in about these practices? Sure, Mr. Martin, would you like to share a little bit about the study? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, so once we started to see some of these results that came in, these positive results, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to document it. And it's really nice for us to go to conferences. We, we've been to several uh, conferences and, and had a lot of discussions about this. And so it, it sounds really nice, but sometimes the way it sounds may not be the way that it really is on paper um, or that it is in the day in and day out. So we wanted to make sure that we were being accurate with our story. So this team got together for a preliminary study. Uh, we used a, um, a platform out of Penn State University called Chartlytics, which is really just a digitized running record. And we started, we trained our teachers and our social workers, um, basically everyone that worked with uh, students in the Fab Lab on, on charting behaviors, um, as well as charting different things. You know, autistic support students may have a, uh, some sort of tick or they may have some sort of uh, habit that they have whenever they are, uh, their behaviors escalated or or they're having some mental health issues and we wanted to see how often those were occurring. 
And so we called this a preliminary study because it wasn't a formalized study in any way. Um, and the results were remarkable. I mean, we, when they presented the results to me after um, the first 60 days, I, I mean, it was really unbelievable to see that there were literally um, very few, if any, uh, incidents uh, that occurred during the fab lab time. Uh, again, I go back to what I said about a half hour ago that what we did notice was a real spike in behavior incidents whenever students returned to the classroom. So the one thing that we didn't want to do, and this is certainly no disrespect to phys ed teachers or to an art teacher or to something that kids uh, really gravitate to, we wanted to make sure that this wasn't something that they were just interested in for 30 minutes and then forgot about it the rest of the day. That's where the project-based learning module came, and that's why we'll have people doing uh, studies with or, or, or doing trainings with this. But it's really important that we document this. Uh, this will be a much more formalized study. We've decided to do this with all of our students in our CTES classrooms. And this summer, we'll begin the process by reviewing data and taking a look at past behaviors um, and documenting those. And we'll do a year-long study with those students. Um, the, it'll probably be about one school year. And then we'll take uh, the beginning of next summer to analyze the results. But um, we welcome you folks to uh, be part of this and certainly, um, you know, email us or if, if you have questions or you'd like to know how that's going because we're very interested with this. Um, everybody's on board with this. And this really um, will document and provide that evidence that this strategy is in fact working. I can tell you that it really is. I can tell you that our teachers are a lot happier. I can tell you that our students are a lot happier. It's a much uh, better place to be. And I can tell you also that this um, this strategy isn't just for students with documented mental health illnesses. Um, we have mental health issues in our daily lives. Um, um, people just have those. And so uh, by having that as a timeout area and having that for students to be able to, uh, students who don't have those documented issues to be able to go into the fab lab is, um, is a really, really good thing for our school system. And, and, and it really creates a positive school culture and climate. So. Um, we're looking forward to the study. We will definitely share those results. We have a whole team ready to go with this. Um, and we'll start this uh, preliminary, uh, the preliminary data collection very soon. Q &A, uh, gentlemen, I know this may sound, uh, uh, may sound naive, but um, is, can you or have you tracked uh, have you tracked the academic process progress of these students I mean how what is the effect there if any that you are seeing so um, we haven't formally tracked the academic behavior side which is something we want to look at as well but I do know that there have been changes in how our teachers have approached the instruction academically, which has, have engaged the students more. So as Mr. Martin said, this last year, um, as the students were coming into the lab, we also had teachers that wanted to come on board with project-based learning. And um, the school actually did a project on the Wright brothers that started with a fab lab unit but ended up reaching out into every content area and had a tremendous impact on the students and what they turned in as writing assignments, math work, science experiments, all around that. And teachers saw an increase in engagement, participation in the, in the work that was coming into them. We haven't at this point done a formal on academic, but definitely the informal things that we're seeing are pointing us in that direction that there's an impact on the academic uh, side of things as well. Jenny, there are, and so everyone, there was a question um, on the uh, chat. Um, can you share some experiences where you felt disappointed or willing to quit? So I think that's a, a really fair question. Um, and you hear all these success stories. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, uh, while there were uh, experiences where we were disappointed, um, I don't feel personally, I don't feel there was ever a time where we wanted to quit. Um, I think those disappointments only energized us more. Um, listen, in the fab lab, uh, I'm going to give you an answer that you, you probably will think is a canned answer, but in the fab lab, um, we, these are students that have failed significantly in their lives. Um, and so 
we have to find a positive energy with that failure. Um, these aren't kids. Are, these are not kids who are going to be successful on the first go around. They have proven that they have failed in different areas in their lives. And so what we did was this mindset with our teachers and with our staff that failure is okay in this environment. And that we, while we don't always promote failure, we learn from those failures. And so as our students learn from their failures with their um, innovations or inventions or whatever they may do, we learn as well. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, Jenny and Joe uh, and Michelle, as well as the teachers and our administrator up there, have really had a lot of different sessions for teachers where uh, we've been able to share out some things. Um, and there are times that, um, that uh, are disappointments, uh, that we have these wonderful lessons, and I'll hear this from our teachers, that they have these wonderful lessons and they don't go as well. Um, but that is, really goes along with that philosophy with the kids, that we need to learn from that and figure out why they didn't go that well. And understand that with teachers, there's gonna be failure too. Um, so there's a lot of trust that has to be involved with this process. Uh, you can't have an administrator who's going to be kind of a gotcha administrator. You can't have people around you who aren't going to promote this. Um, we promote our teachers that, look, this isn't going to happen overnight. We're not there yet. We're, we're certainly, we may not be halfway there yet. Um, we have a lot of work to do with our project-based learning. Uh, but with that mindset that we're in this together and that we'll share those disappointments and learn from them, I can tell you from you know, a somewhat of a global perspective that that's okay. And we stress that to our administrators uh, when we, we meet with them on a regular basis, that it has to be okay for teachers and students to fail because that's how we learn from this process. And I, I also can add that I think what helps us is that we do have a strong core team that helps to bring everyone together. We've had changes in personnel, we've had setbacks, I don't think we've wanted to quit because that core team has really helped move everyone forward together. We've been very supportive, and I think that core team is what makes us successful. There's another question there in the chat. Um, Don, I don't know if you want to tackle that one. Well, I can tell you uh, that when we started this process, um, this wasn't a pretty sight in this many cases, in some cases. Um, we had some uh, folks that, again, the trust factor, and we literally had some teachers that came to us and said, look, um, this is, this may be a, a cross a, or a, a, a fork in the road that I, I have to, I'm not willing to go down this path. Uh, we had an administrator who retired. Um, she did not believe in this philosophy on educating alternative education students or students with mental health. And, um, she was very forthright with, with us, and uh, we told her that this is the way it's going to be. I can tell you this. When we started this process, it is very, I don't care what you do in this business. You can't force teachers to do things they don't want to do. You have to be patient. Um, you have to have that level of, of patience with people, and you take those people that want to do it. You take those people that want to take that leap. And then you really, really show them. So in faculty meetings, what we did in our entire first year is we would share success stories in our faculty meetings. And we would have those teachers discuss that. There were a lot of naysayers in that audience at that point. And then what we saw was we saw some, uh, some evolving that happened during that process where teachers said, well, maybe I will give this a try. We also promoted a lot of team teaching, a lot of group work. So teachers were a little worried. They were intimidated to go in there. Um, you know, they didn't know how to run a laser cutter. They didn't know how to run a 3D printer um, or a vinyl cutter. So there was a lot of intimidation there, a learning curve. And so what we said to them was, look, we're going to put groups together. We're going to have groups of teachers go in there. We provided a ton of professional development. During lunchtime, our fab lab manager would be on hand to show people that at the beginning of the day before the kids came in, we would be there. We had professional development days for those teachers. So it really takes a lot of effort. You're not going to get everybody on board. We still don't have everybody on board, but I can tell you right now, um, unless my uh, fellow um, colleagues want to disagree with me, I can tell you right now that we have probably a 99% participation rate from our teachers and staff. I, can't, I couldn't tell you that four years ago or two years ago. That's, that, that took work to get to that point. This will not happen overnight. 
Thank you, Don. And just for those who didn't see the question in the chat, um, Don was basically sharing the process for managing to get teachers on board because many sites struggle with that. We've got another question in the chat here. Um, they want to know of any other resources they might explore in terms of combining technical workshops with mental wellness, empowerment, empowerment or mindfulness techniques. Okay, um, this is Michelle, and I would just add that um, mindfulness in schools uh, is, uh, even though it has a 25-year history, is uh, really getting recognition uh, for the impact that it can have on mental wellness, uh, and as a resource for students who are experiencing mental health needs uh, for um, having success with whatever the um, um, uh, outcome that you want. So whatever it's, you know, you're doing uh, traditional learning or you're doing uh, fabrication learning. Um, so um, I, I would just explore more uh, with the uh, mindfulness schools and resources. And ad additionally with the epic fail um, is, is an exercise that we do. Students are encouraged to recognize that failure is learning. Um, so that not, not to be, um, not, not, not to re reject that, but to embrace it as a learning opportunity. So I, I think that might be helpful to you. Thank you. Um, we, we have, I think, one more question coming in. Um, do you have groups with a limited number of students? How is the number decided on equipment availability or staff numbers? So can you talk a little bit about how students are moved through the lab and how many are engaging in them? So I'll jump in with kind of the, the overall um, view of that. And Michelle, you can kind of jump in more with the particular day-to-day -day, um, of that. But, but our, um, our state regulation is we can't have more than 12 emotional support students at a time, um, you know, in a room. So the, ma the max number is 12. Um, that would be in the lab at any given time of these groups. Um, so they kind of start off in a general kind of whole group exercise where – uh, those classrooms right now are running between 10 and 12 students, so they're, they're at max, if not pretty much there. Um, so, you know, that's where we kind of started at. Um, it's not really based so much on the number of staff, number of equipment. We, we have to kind of meet the state regulations um, on those numbers. And then, Michelle, if you kind of want to mm -hmm. jump in on how they might move throughout an activity in the lab. Okay, so they begin with the uh, general instruction. Uh, the teacher presents what it is that they're going to be working working through, and and then they go to their computers or uh, whatever equipment that they're using and work with their own speed. So part of the skill that we are teaching is learning to wait, uh, because if there are only two laser cutters and there are twelve students, then they learn to take their turn. They learn to wait. Um, they learn to self-regulate and and uh, work on another area of interest in the fab lab. Um, while their project is, is being printed. So those are some, some of the skills that we have to work in there with um, mental health um, based on equipment availability. And I'll also add in about staffing, and Michelle, you can, you can add in this as well. We do have a full-time Fab Lab teacher mm -hmm. uh, inside of our Fab Lab, and Michelle is our full-time social worker. She goes between two of our labs. She's dedicated just mm -hmm. to social work in the Fab Lab. Um, in addition to that, we have the regular classroom teacher who can uh, uh, come into the Fab Lab with the class as well, as well as any uh, paraeducators or aides that are assisting students uh, in the classroom. And sometimes another social worker will join too. So just depending mm -hmm. on the day, um, they may have a variety of, of uh, adults in the room with them, but we do have mm -hmm. every time they're in there, a regular Fab Lab teacher and Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. so there's plenty of staff um, based on the students' needs um, because it's a CTS setting or uh, an alternative ed setting. Well, everyone, I'm looking at our time. We're, we're a little bit over at 635, but mm -hmm. tackling a really robust conversation. So um, on behalf of the network and the FAB team here, we want to definitely thank IU1 
um, all of you for the amazing work that you're doing and your willingness to share out with the network. Uh, we would encourage everyone to uh, take a look at the SOAPS website where you can find this amazing collection um, that IU1 has presented to us around mental health and wellness, as well as over 100 other interesting lessons integrating digital fabrication um, into classroom and learning uh, experiences for young people. And I see this final question coming in um, inquiring if there were plans to host future webinars on this topic. Um, I think it's definitely one that we will go back to IU1 to 